Thank you for the, for the opportunity today to, to present. Uh, the idea is to try and bring everything together, uh, like most economists do. They try to bring lots of things together and then say, no, but the assumption is this and the assumption is that, and then models become unrealistic. But I'm going to try and, and, and follow a line um, from the current situation globally and where South Africa stands when it comes to energy access. Um, continuing to a few ideas on technologies, although I'm not an expert and I'm very glad that the two first presenters uh, spoke a lot about technologies. And uh, then the, the thinking process goes to what do technologies need? Technologies need money. Uh, what kind of money? We're talking R&D and what we should be careful on when we're talking R&D. So the last few part when I, I will speak about R&D comes from um, mine and my students' research um, we're busy with currently. Okay, so I don't know if the colors look and how they look, um, but the, the idea is on the left hand side you see poverty, economic poverty, and the right hand side you see energy use. And you can see clearly where you have the big colors, the, the red and the pinks and everything in poverty, that's where you have the light colors in energy use. So looking at the maps, Africa has the highest levels of economic poverty and the lowest levels of energy use. Clearly there should be a connection there. We all understand economic development and what we teach our first year students that the three pillars of economic development is what? Energy, water and food. You can't have economic development, you can't take your population out of poverty if you don't provide water, energy, and food. Access to electricity in Africa and the world, these are state, uh, statistics from um, International Energy Agency, they are from 2014. Um, as an academic, I don't always use the latest data because they are the ones that will be re-looked at and re-evaluated and all of these things. So 2014, high income countries, full access to electricity. Oh, let me explain, the blue ones, percentage of access to electricity in total population, red in rural population, and green in urban population. So high income countries, 100% in everything. Middle in income countries, we see urban population, rural population, you see the differences, it's not 100%, but especially in urban population, it's close to 100%. And that's where the, the big differences start. Low income, we discuss about not even 30% of the population having access to electricity. And surely three years down the line, things have not changed drastically. Um, urban population passes the 50% mark, but what does this mean? That means that in a city, every second household has electricity. It's, it's astounding, it's, it's, it's scary. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, excluding the high income African countries, so guess who is that? Um, the situation is a little bit better than the low-income countries, but not substantially better. South Africa, you can see that we look closer to the middle-income countries, but still there's much work to be done, especially in the rural areas. So what needs to be done, or what, what should we think? We think always about access to electricity as one demonstration of energy poverty. However, energy poverty is more than just the access to electricity. So a definition that I always like, it's a 2000 definition, but it includes, it's, it's very inclusive of all the issues that are around energy poverty. So it states that the abs uh, energy poverty is the absence of sufficient choice in accessing adequate, affordable, reliable, high quality, safe, and environmentally benign energy services to support economic and human development. It doesn't say just give access to electricity. It says ma many more things. It talks about quality of electricity, it talks about safety, it talks about affordability. Um, we've started, I was on the airplane a, a couple of years back and I was, look, and, uh, was watching a docu uh, documentary, I mean, nerd me watching a documentary in the flight. <laughs> Um, that was talking about energy poverty in UK and I was thinking what are you going to tell me now there's, there's no energy poverty in UK forget about it 
and they were discussing about energy poverty from the point of affordability view. E in energy prices have increased that much so that many households cannot afford in many cases to get energy for heating purposes, especially households with unemployed people, disabled people or older people. So we, we have to start thinking of energy poverty not only as lack of access but also as all the other things. Are we satisfied if we give energy to a household but this energy is not safe? So this household at any moment gets exploded. That's not the idea. Um, a number of specific elements we have to start thinking, both as researchers as, uh, um, as well as policymakers. Different impacts of energy poverty. So it's not only to see, it's not only lighting that we're talking about. We're talking about heating, we're talking about cooking. Um, we're talking about communication. You see the little mannequin in the middle, now a Greek one saying mannequin in South Africa. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, middle, <laughs> the person in the middle with the plug and the battery that is pop. <laughs> it means energy affects also communication. And that's very important in current times. It affects knowledge. Um, and then down there, I'm, I'm, I'm having me and the maps again. Um, population without access to clean cooking. So you see, the important thing is to see where is the colors. And again, the color, colors are in the southern part of the planet. Um, what have we been doing all this time? We've been thinking inside the box. So how to get the grid to the people to connect them with electricity? We haven't been thinking like what we heard from the previous presenter, outside the box. Um, we, haven't, we have started thinking about technologies, but many times the technologies are staying in the labs because they're either too expensive or we don't, they're not commercially acceptable or the people don't know about it or they don't know how to use them. So they just stay where they are. So we think outside the box, but how can we think outside the box? What will help us? So another little graph, International Energy Agency again, um, the latest energy access outlook, the 2017. So on the, you see the annual number of people gaining access by fuel source, 2000, 2015. So the left hand side you see the 2000, the right hand side you see the 2015. So the main fuel that helps with energy access is still coal. However, we, what we want to see is that right-hand side boxes to start becoming lighter and lighter, okay? So we want to see waste there, we want to see solar, we want to see hydro. We see some changes, you start counting the boxes now. We see some changes, but not big changes. Um, thinking outside of the box, providing electricity to all by 2030, look at the investment needed. Look at what is happening with the grid, mini grid and off grid. New technologies are taking in. Okay? So the idea is not just try to bring the, the traditional grid to all of these areas, but start thinking of mini grids, of off grids, island grids. How can we do that? As I said, technology, technological improvement, quality research and new knowledge. I like the idea earlier that was discussed that we don't want only um, patents or papers or ideas that go one step forward. We want to revolutionize what is happening around us. How can this happen? Of course, some researchers are, are dreaming wider than others and some researchers have the capacity to do that. But what connects all the researchers, especially when it, it comes to um, proposing new technologies or inventing new technologies is funding. I mean, if there's any researcher that disagrees, please raise your hand. Yeah, I, I thought so. So, research and development expenditure. Um, to be honest, if you look at the countries all over the world, the moment an economic crisis hits a country, the first thing that gets reduced is research and development expenditures, because now we have more serious problems to, to solve. Uh, I come from a country that exactly that happened recently. 
and we've seen the expenditure of the university has almost been 50% of what it used to be. Uh, library is not being able to subscribe to journals or buy books since 2015. Um, so you can't do research without that. So you see that we're talking about in the best of the cases 4% of GDP goes to um, research and development. 4% in the best of cases. You can imagine that this research and development has so many applications not only on energy. How did energy R&D do through the years? So on the, right, on the left hand side I show you the total energy R&D in G7 countries. Why did I pick the G7 countries? Why do you think I picked the G7 countries? Because there's no data for other countries. There's not there is data on annual reports of some governments, of some countries, every year, every second year, every third year. You have energy R&D, but in some countries they give you the different energy applications of R&D. In some other countries they don't. Um, so it's not quality data that you can present somewhere. So, and this is changing, I must say. The problem is that we don't have time series yet. So total energy R&D in G7 countries, you see through the years, it has been decreasing. So instead of throwing money, to, to put it simply, throwing money to areas that we have problems with, energy demand, energy security, energy sustainability, we, on the contrary, decrease the energy R&D R &D through the years. Um, the graph next to it with the colors, it's just an indication that if we translate that to a million US dollars, we basically have decreasing or constant energy R&D. Uh, 